I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving and good morning to each and every one of you. It's good to see you all here today. If by any chance you're worshiping with us for the first time, please fill out a visitor card. They look like this and place it in the offering plate as it comes by. Have a few things I need to cover real quick. First of all, there's a mistake in the bulletin. Uh, there is no men's study this week. We won't start that back till after the first of the year. We will have the Wednesday daytime study. We'll be finishing up the Global Methodist in the daytime. We've already finished it at night. Uh, next week is hanging of the green service in this service. Uh, we're going to need some people, if at all possible, here Friday. Uh, we're going to do the pre-decorating for it, so anybody that could come help with that, we would greatly appreciate it, and then we're going to practice for it, uh, excuse me, on Saturday, uh, so I hope that you'll be part of that. Also, one week from tonight, to kick off Advent Christmas season, the Gadsden State Show Choir will be here with their Christmas program like they did for us last year. That was Very unbelievably good. awesome last year. I hope you'll come and be part of that. And then two weeks from now, the Cheney Felt family will be back. And then uh, somebody was asking about the newsletters. They'll be out this week. But in regard to Christmas Eve, I've heard people asking. We're doing a single service only on Christmas Eve at 4 o'clock. We're doing that so that everybody can have more Christmas more Eve morning with their family and have Christmas Eve uh, afterwards with their family. But we're going to do a single service for the entire church at 4 o'clock on Christmas Eve where we will uh, worship, have candlelight communion, uh, and do some of the traditional things that make Christmas Eve so beautiful uh, for all of us. So I hope that you'll plan now on being part of that. Are there any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Well, let's pray together. Father God, we just come before you on this awesome day, a day that is set aside to honor your Son as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And I pray, God, that what we do here today will help us to realize how awesome you are. In Jesus' name, amen. And now if you would hear a scripture from Revelation chapter 19. After this, I heard the sound of a vast crowd in heaven shouting, Hallelujah, salvation is from our God. Glory and power belong to him alone. His judgments are just and true. He has punished the great prostitute. He has corrupted the earth with her immorality. And he has avenged the murder of his servants. Again and again their voices rang, Hallelujah, the smoke from that city ascends forever and ever. Then I saw heaven opened, and a white horse standing there, and the one sitting in the horse was named Faithful and True, for he judges fairly and then goes to war. His eyes were bright like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And the name was written on him, and only he knew what it meant. And he was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his title was the word of God. And on his robe and his thigh was written this, King of kings and Lord of lords. Please stand together as we join in singing, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Hymn number 327 in your hymnals. Crown him with me.
now let us join together in this beautiful, powerful, and ancient creed of the Christian faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, and for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son he is worshiped and glorified. He is spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. now sing together hymn number 64 holy holy holy
I'm happy to introduce, we've got um, Tommy Gramling playing the trumpet for us today. If you all have noticed, we're going to have that for the season of Advent at least. And um, while he's able to come from Gadsden City High School, he's a senior. So we are very happy to have him join us. Diane, I was just wondering about that. You got anything you want to add to that? I'm glad to have him here too. <laughs> and why is that, Diane? Pardon? Why is that? Because he's my youngest grandson, and he just turned 18 on Thursday while he was in Philadelphia marching in the oldest Thanksgiving parade. Awesome! In the country. Glad to have you here. <laughs> I, I thought Grandmama might want to say something. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit prejudiced. <laughs> Glad to have him here. We are too. Uh, Miss Kim Tucker is going to help with children's minutes if her children want to come down this morning. Good morning. Wow, that's really loud. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Did y'all have a good Thanksgiving? Yes. 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 What were some of the things you were thankful for? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, that my dad's friends got to come over. That dad's friends got to come over. My friends and family. Friends and family. Friends and family. I'm thankful for a lot of things. I'm thankful to be here today. I'm thankful for y'all. I'm thankful for my friends and family. But I am mostly thankful for the birth of Christ. And as we transition from Thanksgiving to Christmas, we need to start thinking about all the things God has, all, has done for us. Now we should think about that all year long, right? Are y'all excited for Christmas? All the lights and trees, you got any decorations up yet? Yes. Yeah, Santa's coming, Santa's coming. But let's think about Christ. I brought some ornaments that the children and I made last year, and I thought if y'all would like to take one and take it with you, just grab one, pick one and take it with you, pass it down. Pass it down. Then as you hang these on your tree, then I want you to think about all the things God has done for us. And I gotta get my paper out here. Hold on. Luke 17, 12 through 19 says he's cared for the poor, he held the sick. And in Matthew 17 through 13 through 14, he never turned away little children and his love was never ending. So let's think about that during the birth of Christ this year as we transfer from, thanks, from being thankful for Thanksgiving to thankful for Christ. Are we going to pray now? Let me pray. Heavenly Father, help us remember as we move from the Thanksgiving season into Advent that the greatest gift for which we should give thanks is the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's join together in a congregational time of prayer together. Gracious Heavenly Father, as we set this time apart each week in our worship service to pray, <clears throat> not for me to have a prayer, but for us all to have a prayer together. And Father, I think it is important for us each week to consider who you are and what you've done for us to offer up words of praise and thanksgiving for your faithfulness to us, 
for your never-ending love for us, for your grace shown to us, for your healing hand upon many of us. And Father, while we praise you for all of that, we come before you to admit that even though we know all of that is true, sometimes we still get caught up in our daily lives. Sometimes we get so caught up we forget that you're there. Sometimes in the midst of hurrying and scurrying this time of year, uh, we forget to spend time in prayer or really to even think about what this season is all about. And yet, God, you know that we're mere human beings and you're patient with us. And for that, we give thanks. We rely upon your grace to forgive us of sin. And Father, I pray today that as we move through the remainder of this worship service, that when the choir sings this beautiful song they're going to sing in a few minutes, that it will set us up to really think about how majestic and holy you are and that you would come to die for us. And Father, we thank you so much that we get the privilege and honor as ambassadors for Christ each and every week to lift up those prayer concerns that are on our hearts this morning. And Father, while there are many that I can't think, just think of them all, as I look over and I see Larry Etchison without Dinah, I pray for her. I know that she's been going through a real tough time with this leg. And I thank you that hopefully that procedure will help, but that she will get through the rehab part of it, the healing part, so that she can get some relief for that. And Lord, be with Larry to comfort her, as I know he will. And Father, I'm also mindful for people that can't be here because of other sickness. I think of uh, this morning, Ralph Westmoreland, who joined our church and spoke a few weeks ago, but who is really struggling with his health issues. And I thank, Lord, of those that are going to be having a surgical procedure soon, such as um, Dennis uh, Henderson and Becky Bradley. And I pray that you will get them through that. But Father, I know that there are other prayer concerns that we need to lift up this morning. And I pray that as these names and situations are spoken, that you will not only hear them, but you will react, respond in a way that only the God of the universe can do. And so please hear the prayer concerns of my brothers and sisters. Any others? Carol, I'm done away as she fights Parkinson's and other multiple illnesses. Yes. Yes. And Father, I think about the ministry many of us are doing in ringing the bell for Salvation Army and a mindful of the people that receive uh, uh, that help from salvation and other resources it's this time of year that for them this time of year can be difficult and we lift them up to you and father again we pray that all that we do as a church will glorify your precious name for we ask this prayer in that precious name of jesus as we pray together our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's worship the Lord now by the giving of our tithes and offerings.
celebrate this beautiful time of year, dear Lord of Advent, where we give back to you, Lord, our tithes and offerings. Blessed be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. In your sweet name I pray. Amen. join together in reading our prayer of illumination. Since we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth, make us hunger for this heavenly food that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Amen. Today's scripture comes from Mark 10, 32 through 34. They were now on the way to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. The disciples were filled with dread, and the people following behind were overwhelmed with fear. Taking the twelve disciples aside, 
Jesus once more began to describe everything that was about to happen to him in Jerusalem. When we get to Jerusalem, he told them, the Son of Man will be portrayed, will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, beat him with their whips, and kill him. But after three days, he will rise again. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Giving you an insert if you'd like to follow along today because there's gonna, we're going to have a lot of different scriptures. But first I want to share with you all, as I was working on the sermon this week, for some reason I was thinking about the kingship of Jesus and the word oxymoron came to mind. I don't know why, but do you know what an oxymoron is? It's not a doofus. You know, it's, uh, it's a contradictory term where... Two words that seemingly don't together jam together. So give me, here's some uh, funny ones I found from the internet. Uh, government organization. <laughs> Temporary tax increase. 12 ounce pound cake. Express mail. Here's one, whoever wrote it, probably going to get in trouble. So I'm just repeating this. Marital bliss. <laughs> Peacekeeper missile. Bure Bure bureaucratic efficiency. Living dead. And here's two that I thought I'd add. Roll eagle and war tide. <laughs> but the biggest and most true oxymoron of all time is God man. Because when we think about God, God is high, ruler, creator, infinite, perfect, and eternal. But man, humanity, is created by God, subject to the ruler, but we're less than perfect, and we're mortal, aren't we? And yet, through Jesus Christ, God and man come together, fully human and fully God. And we'll be talking about that through the Advent season. We affirmed it in the Nicene Creed that we read earlier. But since today is a special day that ever since I've been in the ministry, I've always tried to honor Christ the King Sunday. Because I think it's a way that we sort of move over from Thanksgiving and go into Advent and to honor the Lord Jesus. But when we think about the word king, we have some good examples and some bad examples in the, in the Bible, don't we? We got King Saul who started out pretty good, but then he wouldn't listen to what God told him, so he didn't turn out so good. David, a man after God's own heart, but he committed adultery. Solomon, who started out pretty good, but then he chased after the foreign ladies and got himself in trouble. Then we got kings in history, like King Henry VIII, who killed his wives, because uh, some of them because they would not give him an heir to the throne. Then we got King Louis of France, who caused the French Revolution. So when we talk about the word king, we talk about somebody with absolute power and authority. And I learned in history years ago that there was something called, and I think I've mentioned it in past, uh, the divine right of kings. And a lot of these kings thought that God had put them on the throne, and so therefore anything they did was appropriate, <clears throat> and that they were cut above everybody else. And because of that, sometimes they'd abuse their power. But when we refer to Jesus as king, all of that really kind of doesn't go together. Because he's not arrogant. He's not, he doesn't try to abuse his power. But why do we even refer to Jesus as king? We read from Revelation, but there's some other scriptures that I want to share with you this morning. First of all, did you know that in the Old Testament, God promised King David that he would have a descendant 
who would sit on David's throne for eternity. Now, we know a lot of people think that that, that prophecy was talking about Solomon. But it couldn't have been Solomon because Solomon didn't live forever and his kingdom, Judah and Israel, was divided in two. So it couldn't have been him. But Jesus is the descendant on the human side from David and he is the one who remains king of kings and lord of lords. Then there's this other scripture that we read this time of year that I've always loved. Isaiah chapter 9 where it says, Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then it says this, Of the increase of his government and the peace there will be no end. And on the throne over David's kingdom, he will establish it and hold it with justice and righteousness from this time forward. And how about the time when Jesus himself was brought before Pilate and Pilate and Jesus get into discussion and Pilate said, are you a king then? And Jesus said, well, my kingdom is not of this world. And he said, but I am a king. In fact, I, I was born as a king to come into this world and testify for the truth. But still, with all of that, what do we mean? Well, I prayed about it, and God kind of brought some things from different scriptures that I wanted to share when I think about Jesus being the king. First of all, did you know that Jesus is the king of the past? I gave you some scripture in your outline that's from first, excuse me, Colossians chapter 1. Where Paul writes, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before God made, every, made anything at all and is supreme over all creation. Christ is the one through whom God created in heaven and earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't. Everything has been created through him and for him. We, have, we acknowledged that a while ago in the Nicene Creed. That this is a scriptural truth. Paul, uh, John even talks out about it in 1 John. And I don't completely understand it because I've been a preacher for 30 years. But I still don't, I cannot fully explain to you the tr Holy Trinity. That our God is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But according to scripture, God the Father created all that was created through God the Son. So in other words, everything was made by Him. Greg, I think you told me you shared that with somebody coming to your house the other day, didn't you? So when I think about the fact that He's the one that created it all, who better to come straighten out the mess we've made of it than Him Himself? And what I think is really cool is when you consider that Christ is part of the Godhead, that means he's been around forever. So he is the king of, he is the God and king of the patriarchs of the Old Testament, Jacob and Isaac and all of those and Sarah. And if your great, 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 great mother, grandparents were Christians, they were his king, they were their kings too. I think that's cool that this Jesus that we're worshiping today is the same Jesus that our ancestors worshiped. I just find that, being the history buff in me, I just find that so awesome that he doesn't change. Jesus once said, before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus is the king of history, which is his story. Jesus has been working throughout all time to work to bring humanity back to God. And even when things happen that we don't understand, that baffles us, we can be assured because our king died for us that everything he's allowing has a good purpose that we may not understand. But Jesus is also the king of the present. Another thing that Paul says in Colossians 
He existed before everything else, and he holds all creation together. That's a big theological truth, folks, that we sometimes can't get our mind around. That the force of Christ, through his Holy Spirit, is what holds a creation in existence. Without him being involved, creation would dissolve. Our earth would be slam into the sun. Our earth would quit spinning. We'd have no more days and nights. It wouldn't shift on its axis. We wouldn't have fall or summer or spring. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm kind of glad fall got here. I told Bridget, I remember many a time I used to fuss. I want winter time. I want it to be about 35 degrees and snow. Y'all, I'm thankful for the 50s this year. Because after having those hundreds in the summer, 50s feel mighty good, don't they? Thank God that we get the seasons. And see, another thing about Jesus being the king of the present is through his spirit, he is the one that's bringing humanity to salvation as he draws us to himself. But, the for a person... To make Jesus their king in the present, they have to invite him to be their king. They can't, Jesus will not, he's not like other kings. He doesn't make you accept him as his king. You have to willingly say yes to his kingship in your life. And y'all know that. But also it occurred to me from the, from the Bible that Jesus is the king of the future. For in Revelation, he's called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And what is happening in Revelation, we're talking about the end times when Christ will put down all of the enemies of God, Satan and all of his dominions, and any human being that refused to accept Christ and stood up against God will be put down. And that God himself, according to Paul in 2 Timothy 4.1, has given Christ the Son the final authority to be judge over all of creation. And folks, I like that. Because if Jesus was willing to die for us, I'm kind of glad he is going to be our final judge, aren't y'all? But I, as I was working on this sermon... One of the things that always hits me on point stuff like this is it's so theological that you can hear me preach it and it might not sink it in. And the Holy Spirit led me to say that before I go any further this morning, I would like for us to stop for a minute and let me pray before I go further. So would you bow your heads as I pray? Almighty God, I humbly and sincerely ask that your Holy Spirit would fall upon us in a very special way in this time in order that you would help us to truly understand the royal majesty of your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to grasp just how high and holy a position you bestowed upon him in order that we might be more appreciative of what he has done for us. And Jesus, as I cover these last three points, I ask that my words would glorify your precious name. Amen. And so what is so different about the kingdom of Jesus? To me, this is why he is is indeed uh, like an oxymoron. That most kings throughout history sat on their thrones, and sent out their soldiers to die for them. But Jesus came to die for his subjects. As we were reading through Mark, I wanted deliberately to have the Mark text that Jennifer read today, read today. Because Jesus said, The Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. They will sentence him to die and hand him over to the Romans. They will mock him, spit on him, beat him with their whips, and kill him. 
Folks, the point I'm trying to get is Jesus knew it was going to happen to him before it even happened. It did not catch him by surprise. He knew that his main purpose was to be the sacrificial lamb whose blood would be spilled that we might have eternity. And so when I think about that every year with the Christ the King Sunday, it amazes me when I think about presidents, dictators, generals, all of these people throughout human history that they've always sat back and let the other people do the dying while they sit in the background, but not Jesus. He came to die for us. And why did he do this? Another scripture I love. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 8-9, through 9, Paul writes, You know how full of love and kindness the Lord Jesus Christ was. Though he was very rich, now think about that. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He has all the glory and honor in heaven that gold doesn't even mean nothing to him. Rubies don't mean anything to him. He has all the riches that heaven has to offer. And yet, Paul says, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty, He could make you rich. He came down and gave up his glory so that he could raise us up into his glory. We should be thankful. Another thing that makes his kingdom different is he was not crowned in a normal way. If any of y'all watched on May 6th this year, uh, King Charles was finally had a coronation. And that's a real big deal in England. The uh, head honcho of the King of England puts the crown on the monarch's head uh, to signify that he is now king. Uh, and what is really cool, I looked up some things to really kind of contrast what happened for Charles versus what happened for Jesus. Um, for example, he sat down on a 700-year-old throne. The throne that he sat on when he was was made king was 700 years old. They put on this fine royal robe on him. He was given this golden orb. It looks like a world, but it's full of jewels. And he takes that as a signify that, that God has given him authority to rule. But here's what I thought was interesting. When they put that crown in his head... That sucker has 2,868 diamonds in it. As well as hundreds of pearls and other gemstones. That thing's worth a lot. (laughs) But listen to our Lord's story. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and y'all know it. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They made a crown of long, sharp thorns and put it on his head. They placed a stick in his right hand as a scepter. They knelt before him in mockery, yelling, Hail the king of the Jews. They spit on him and grabbed the stick and beat him. His crown was made out of thorns. Rather than being having a royal robe, they stripped off his real robe that he had that his mother had made, and they cast lots for it. And rather than sitting on a royal robe, uh, excuse me, sitting on a royal uh, throne, he was nailed to a cruel cross. That's what they did to him. But who is they? We are they. It was our sin that caused all that to happen. But what did this sovereign power do? Did he come down to take revenge and blast us all away? No, he said those famous words we all know. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And finally, what makes his kingdom different? As it is eternal. 
All of the kings throughout history and all the queens throughout history have one thing in common. They all died. Their kingdoms were stripped from them by their own death. And even though they may have thought they were mere, that they were more than mortals, they were proven that whether we're rich or poor, whether we're pauper or king, we all die, don't we? But not so for the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I've already mentioned before what God had promised about Jesus and his kingdom. But then we can't forget that awesome part of Scripture. From Daniel chapter 7 that I've harped on ever since I've been here. I saw one who looked like a man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, and royal power over all the nations of the world so that every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Never, folks. You see, Daniel saw a vision of the eternal Son of God coming before the Father, and the Father bestowed upon him this never-ending kingdom. And you know what? That really hit me as we're reading Daniel again, that it reminds me that though Satan may try to destroy and stop the kingdom of Jesus here on earth, he cannot. And folks, guess who is part of this kingdom? Every single believer. That means, though, that Satan may try to throw everything at us to try to give us up, but if we cling tightly to our king, we too will stand forever and we cannot be defeated because we serve the sovereign, most powerful king of the universe. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much and for all that you are and who you've done, who, what all you've done. And Father, we ask that you help us to honor your son Jesus in our own lives. And Lord, when we feel defeated, help us to be remembered that we are children of the King. And help us to live that way. For we ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord has spoken to you and anything that's happened today and you'd like to have a time of prayer, the altar is open as we stand to sing something about our king, what our king did for us and the way he was honored by humanity that rather than a throne, he had a cross. Join me in standing together to sing the old rugged cross, hymn number 504.